How many of you have ever found yourself wrestling with God, what he wants for your life? So I, so I was good. I'm on, well, we're on the same page then. That's good. Um, 1 Samuel 3, 1 through 11. Now the, now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. I want you to know that every time you see word used, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, we know that the word is Jesus Christ. And so we know that Jesus was sown into the world as a seed that they may bear much fruit, right? So the word is important. If you don't have, I'll just say this, if you don't have word in your life, you don't have fruit in your life, Amen. right? This is extremely important because we can talk all day long in the church about the importance of discipleship and the importance of going to small group and the importance of doing these things and the importance of, but if you're not in the word, I'm, I'm not talking about Sunday morning. I mean, we come and we get in the word, um, but if you're not sowing this into your life, you won't bear this fruit. So it's very important. And we know that right here in the beginning of the landscape of this story, the word was rare in those days. Let me ask you this question. When you look at your life and you look at the time you spend in this personally, is the word rare in your life? It's amazing because we can come on Sunday, we can read scriptures like this, and we can say, oh my goodness, the word is rare in those days. Oh, you know, not for us, not so. But then when we look personally at our life, not corporately at our gatherings, not corporately in the world, not corporately at church, not corporately for our small group, what everybody else is doing together, but when we look at our personal devotional life, what does that look like? I hope it's not rare in these days because it was rare then. What I've come to know is that things happen in cycles, right? So what was rare then sometimes becomes rare for us now. I, maybe this is speaking in a relevant way. There was no widespread revelation. There was no widespread revelation. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was lying down in his place and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, that's a lot of stuff going on there, that the Lord called Samuel and he said, here I am. So what did Samuel do? He ran to Eli, which is his mentor, and he said, here I am. You called me. And he said, I did not call you. Lie down again. Go to bed. <laughs> I mean, you have your kids run into your room and uh, you're like, go to bed. And he went to lay down. And then the Lord called again, Samuel. So Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. And he said, I did not call you. Go to bed. Go lie down. And verse 10, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. Your knowledge of the Lord and your relationship with the Lord is completely dependent on the word you put in your life. Those who don't have word don't have a relationship. And that's Old Testament. This is Old Testament too. It's preaching. It's preaching into the New Testament world in which we live. And the Lord called Samuel again a third time. I love how he does things in threes. And so he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did, not, you did, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived, Oh, this is what it was like when I heard the Lord speak to me. He, he is enlightened. He becomes aware that, oh, back in the day, I used to hear God too, and this is probably what this is. And so he begins to speak to him and offer him counsel. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you again, he knows who this is now, he's figured it out, that you must say, speak, Lord, for your servant listens. Actually, hears. That's, that's the right word, hears. How awful would it be to talk and give counsel to somebody about how to hear and have a conversation with the Lord when the Lord is no longer speaking to you? How, how, how would that hurt your heart? It should hurt our hearts. 
There are many people who speak about and tell other people and offer counsel to other people and friends about how to incline their ear to the Lord and hear from the Lord when we are not hearing from the Lord ourselves. Our number one responsibility is to hear the Lord ourselves. What would have happened if Eli would have listened for the voice of the Lord? Speak, Lord, your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called as at the other time, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel answered, Speak. For your servant, everybody say servant, hears. That's important. You need to know that Samuel was serving before God spoke to him. This is important. Samuel was serving while he was struggling to hear the Lord. Okay? Samuel was struggling, serving while he was struggling. See, empowerment often comes where there's need. And sometimes, because of our lack of service to the Lord, we're not empowered by the Lord. Why would I need to give strength to that which does not need strength because it is a couch potato for the kingdom? That's a good way to put it, right? He, gives, he empowers that which needs empowerment. Sometimes he calls us to service before he empowers us to do it. And it is in the going that we are empowered. All right, this is important. Now, we would like to preach this, that God will empower you first and you'll be filled with power from on high. Now, you know, we know that we're saved and we're, we're filled with the Holy Spirit, but you can be filled with the Holy Spirit and not have the power to go out and do the things that he's called you to do because we have, we have quenched the Spirit with our inability and unwillingness to go serve him. All right? So he releases power to those that need it. It's important. Now, I would like this morning to tell you that a relationship with God is magic, but it's not. I'd like to tell you that it's easy, but it's not. Okay. All right. How many of you can testify that you've been walking with the Lord a little bit? How many, how many of you know it's not so easy, right? It's not so easy. That's okay. It's okay. I'm, I'm using a really sweet tone today. This is really good. Lean in. Lean in. This don't happen very often. It's all happen. But it's okay. It's all right. It's okay for, for it not to be easy. Anything that has value in your life is not easy. When we started this church nine years ago, it, it was not easy. Oh, I just want to, yes, amen, Lord. And put the mic up to myself. It was not easy. It is not just required a sacrifice for us to move here, but it's required multiple sacrifices, not just from my family's life, but from other staff members' life, not just from staff members' life, uh, lives and energy and time and resources, not required sacrifice just from your pastoral staff, but from every single leader that was here on Friday night. I don't even know how many people were here, maybe 50. 50 volunteers serving the Lord showed up, and it, not everybody was here. That's not all of the service, and, and it, it requires sacrifice, and it's not easy to serve. Are you with me here today? Okay, every single week, let me, let me just, can I, can I be really honest with you? Let's just be really transparent. I mean, you sh I should be all the time. Like, uh, I don't lie to you all the time, but let me just, <laughs> let me just throw something out here that I think is very relevant for us today, Right? Every single Wednesday night, we have our small group at 6.30. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I should know that because it's at my house. Um, <laughs> it's at 6.30. And every single Wednesday, I think in my head and try to figure out if there's some reason we can cancel. All right? Every single week. I, I, every single week. I try to figure out some way that we can cancel. But once we're through, I don't want to go. I'm the pastor of the church. I don't want to go to small group. And every single Wednesday night afterwards, I am almost in tears because of how much it blessed me. To be in a community, to do, you know, you know I'm taking classes. I'm taking a class right now. I'm writing papers. I don't need to study no more. You understand what I'm saying? 
And, but that sacrifice, look, it's not easy to go every Wednesday night. But we don't do stuff because it's easy. We do stuff because it's important. Right? We prioritize our life. We, we place value on things by the time we spend on them. Right? So, you, so we can't say, I value you, God, but I commit no time to you other than an hour on Sunday. See, you, you can, that's a profession of the mouth that doesn't line up with the investment of your life. God calls us to invest in what we value. Some of us have no problem investing in sports. Like, I love some sports. If anybody would like to do, set up like a three-on-three -three thing, I'll kick your butt. And some three-on-three -three basketball. I'll do that. You just call me. We'll get a gym opened up, and we'll play. And I love, I love that. I have no problem sweating. I have no problem, you know, rebounding and knocking your block off. I have no problem doing that. I have no problem beating you at basketball. I have no problem if I fall down skin or bust my eyeball open. It's worth it. It's cool to have a scar. I have a couple of them on my eyebrows from getting elbowed. I, it, it, it doesn't, that cost that sacrifice, that, that, that investment, blood, sweat, and tears, is, is worth it for me. It's worth it. Whether I win or not, it's worth it. And in many areas of our life, we set the worth of our life by what we throw ourselves at. And most often, what we are willing to struggle with. So God is watching our life. I'd love to tell everybody that everything about the kingdom is nice and everybody is nice in the kingdom. But they're not. Some of the nastiest people I've met in my life are church people. Oh, man, come on. Just come on, get real with me for a second. Some of the nastiest people I've ever met are church people. You can be a church person and, not, and you can call yourself a believer, but we know you by your fruits. All right. I, I'd love to tell you that, that you can anoint yourself, lay your hand on your head, have, have the, the, the spiritual fathers of the house anoint you with oil, and that it's going to happen. But that's just not true all the time. It's just not true all the time. Life and a relationship with God is a struggle. It is a struggle every single day. And people who don't and are not willing to struggle in their walk with God, they get left. I know you're looking for a place where there is no struggle, but people who don't struggle get left behind because God is on the move. Because people who don't struggle take opportunities for granted. Listen, standing still is getting left behind. And some of us have stood still in our walk with the Lord and we have not progressed and we are not seeking anymore. And he says, seek me and you will find me. You need to continue to seek him because as we seek him, we draw near to him. And it is in drawing near to him that we don't get left, but it requires action on our part. It requires us to move and to be seeking him day in and day out. You don't have to go backwards. Some churches call it backsliding. You don't have to go backwards to get left behind. Just stop moving. Just stop investing. Just stop reading the Bible. Just stop coming to church. Just, just stop. Just stop doing that to your wife. Just stop loving your wife. Just stop caring for your wife. Just stop being helpful around the house. See where that takes you. Right? Relationships require reciprocity. There is a requirement for reciprocity. Otherwise, it's not a relationship. God is calling us into relationship. We can say all day. Listen, we, can say, we can say this all day. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. Until I have to give reciprocity. Now, it's about religion. So we, we profess with our mouth. The churches love it. The pastors love it. Churches love to shout pastors down. when They say, church is not about religion. It's about relationship. But then we look at the lives of people and we see people in the church that don't have reciprocity. And I'm like, your, your mouth is saying it's not about religion, but your life says it is about religion because I don't want to give you anything. I just want to get stuff from you. And so we come and we shout the pastor down. It's not about religion. And our life is religious. We come, we check in, we check out, but there's no reciprocity. There's no return. Samuel was serving. 
without much word. Samuel was serving without knowing God. <laughs> and it was in his serving, in the midst of a struggle, a struggling situation. Here, here's the, there's nothing worse than being in an atmosphere that is counterintuitive to God's calling. How many of you were raised up in a home that was broken, that was not together, right? Just raise your hand. It's okay. We all come from different backgrounds. And, 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 then, and then you come into the kingdom and you see how the God has structured in biblical terms the, the family environment. It doesn't mean your family's horrible. It doesn't mean your parents are horrible. But there is a structure that God wants to do. And so then when we begin to look at that and we then, we, we, to be like Christ, we can't be like the world. We can't be like what we came from. God's calling us up. And there's nothing harder than when God calls you to greatness from a place of complacency. That's hard. See, it's easy. It's easy to be great when everything around you is great. It's hard to be great when everything around you is poor. All right? So God is saying to get out of this atmosphere that pulls you back down. It is the gravity of problems. It's the gravity of of things that are not like God. It's constantly pulling you back down and God is trying to call you up to greatness. That is hard. It is hard to be different than the world. Amen? Amen. It is hard when you're, when you're engaged and you're about to get married to not have sex. That's hard. That's hard. And the world says, it's okay, we're getting married anyway, but God says, keep yourself pure and holy. All right? Reciprocity. I mean, that was, that was good. That hits a lot of us in the house, right? It hits a lot of us. And we need, it's okay the young people are in here. They need to hear it. They already know it. You don't even want to know how young people are getting pregnant nowadays. It's important. So God is calling us out of, and I know the world says a lot of things. A lot, the world gives us a lot of permission to do things, but God is calling us to greatness. He's not calling us to be common. He's not calling us to be like the world. Matter of fact, if you look like the world, you're not looking like him. Pope Paul, Pope Paul says this, Pope Paul VI, all life demands struggle. Do you know when roots of a tree, when the roots of a tree try to find their way and they run into rock, those roots will break through the rock. It will struggle and struggle and struggle. There are some trees that you can actually see on mountainsides that you can hear rocks popping from the roots, pushing and struggling its way through the impossible. God's called you to be like a tree. And in every life, there will be opposition. For you, listen, nothing will try to prevent you. Life is going to try to prevent you from being rooted. It's because a rooted life is a healthy life, and a healthy life bears fruit. The enemy does not want you to be rooted, and there's going to be things he puts in your way to prevent you from breaking through. It's going to cause struggle. Pope Paul says, all life demands struggle. Those who have everything given to them become lazy, selfish, and insensitive to the real values of life. The very striving and hard work that we so constantly try to avoid is the major building block in the person we are today. How many of you can testify to the fact that there are many things you've come up against and many struggles in your life that have developed you and developed the character in you and made you who you are today. It is the struggle of life that has produced you and made you who you are. It is not the free stuff in life that made you who you are. Okay? Like, like, like I've, been, I've started working out. Okay? First thing was eating right. That was the hardest thing. Working out's good. Now, working out's fun. Ish. Cardio is not fun. It's just hell. The cardio is not fun. But working out is fun. And you get to see a little bit of results. And so, and, but I know what you do is every single time I bench press, it's a struggle to get the weight up. And when it then stops becoming a struggle, what do we do when we're trying to build ourselves up? When, we, when it stops becoming a struggle, we throw more weight on. Because if it's not a struggle, you're not growing. Amen. Oh, that's good stuff. I just did that on the fly. That wasn't even my notes. I like that. That's good. I might do it in the second service. So we actually intentionally put things in our life so that we struggle. Let me propose to you today. Could it be that God allows things to hit your life so that you struggle, so that he can develop the character in you to be strengthened? 
Could it be that it's not magic that we're empowered, but could it be that he puts, lets, allows us to struggle so we're strengthened, not some magic potion that we have and we're automatically strengthened? Could it be? I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying, could it be that he allows us to do that? I don't know. He's God. He's a mystery. But it's a good question to ask. I don't ascribe to this watered-down theology that suggests that if you just name it and claim it, it's going to be yours. I don't believe it. That if you just quote seven scriptures for seven days, it's going to happen every time. I don't believe that. Now, some of you are like, well, that's what's wrong with you, Sean. You didn't believe. We talked last week that, that sometimes we, I do believe that a belief has a lot to do with it, but sometimes we're believing for him to move in a way that he's not going to move. He moved that way yesterday. He's doing something new today. So sometimes it is, do we believe that he's allowing the struggle to help develop and strengthen us? Our belief and whether or not we will be strengthened is determined by what we believe about our struggle. I'm trying to help you believe so that you can get what he wants you to get, right? I'm old school. I know it. I'm young, but I'm old school. I believe the struggle is a part of the process. People who get things without struggle, they don't appreciate them. How many of you have kids that got a college degree eventually, but they wasted lots of money playing games for the first two years because mommy and daddy paid for it? Okay, let me, let, me, let, me, let me break this down this way. How many of your kids don't appreciate the shoes you buy them and take care of them because you paid for them? But the moment they get a job and have to pay for their own shoes, they're buying shoe polish, they're cleaning them things every night, them things are immaculate. They, have, they make shelves in their room to make sure they're put in there because when you have to pay for something, you take care of something. When it's given to you, eh, mom and dad will get me more. That's good. Sometimes in the walk in our life, we have to grow up and we have to begin to invest ourselves. Mom and dad can't pay the bill for the rest of our life if you want to have any form of character in your life. That's good. So when mom and dad comes to you and says, I ain't paying the bill no more, it's okay. It's going to be all right. You're going to grow up. This is where you grow up. This is where you become a man. Now, I know there's some teenagers. I remember being a teenager. I thought I was a man. I thought I was a man because I had an opinion. I thought I was a man because I told my dad one time when he got mad at me to bring it on. And he did, and I almost died. <laughs> I just remember as quick as flash lightning, as quick as flash lightning, he flew across the kitchen like, he, like, like just basically like he was floating on air, grabbed my shirt, and I was up in the air. I was a... I was a bad mamma jamma. I, I, I worked out. I was healthy. And I was up in the air, my feet not touching, two feet off the ground. And I'm going, you want some of me? They're like, no, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. I do not want any of you. My dad was a good man. But sometimes we have to learn we've come up against opposition. See, see. Sometimes we have to learn when to submit. Sometimes you can be bad all day long. You can act like you're a man. You can talk like you're a man. But what makes you a man is not your ability to puff up your chest and act like a man. What makes you a man is standing up, taking care of yourself, being disciplined, and paying your own bill. That's good stuff. That's what makes you a man. What makes you a man, I know, I know it's like, I know this is tricky. What makes me a man is not my beard. It helps a lot. It helps me look like a man. But I can have a beard and be a child. I know a lot of people with beards that are a child. Not in here. Not in here. I know a lot of people with beard, have beards that are ch children. Because the way you look does not determine the, your maturity. Am I preaching yet? It's your... Oh, I just COVIDed you. Uh, anyway. Um... <laughs> It's a fight. It's a fight, life is. Maturity is in the struggle. It's the fight. It's the struggle that helps you appreciate what God has done for your life. If everything is easy, I don't appreciate God's godness. Right? If, I am never, if I never get sick, I don't appreciate him as a healer. Come on now. Sometimes, let me propose to you this, sometimes we want all darkness to be cast out, but it is in the presence of darkness that we see the brilliance of the light. 
God's saying, sometimes a little bit of darkness. It's a, listen, you know what makes a meal good? A little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper. All right, are you with me? It's both. The salt makes the... The, the pe- salt makes the pepper better, and the pepper makes the salt better. That's the way God works, and he will use the dark things of the world to make you see the brilliance of his glory. You know, how can we even glorify the Lord? By magnifying him, by making him bigger than our problems. Sometimes problems help us glorify him. Because why would you turn to God as being bigger than your problem if you never have a problem? Come on now. Sometimes it's the problems and the struggles of life that draw us to him and make us chase him. Light loses its relevance without darkness. Pain and struggle are a part of the process. Listen, people, it's a part of life. If you are struggling today, be encouraged because God is a God of the struggle. He's there. He's present. A promise is not powerful if it is not painted on the backdrop of a problem. Why do you need a promise if you don't have a problem? Come on now. The Israelites were led out of captivity, out of land that was not theirs, enslaved and in bondage. And he promised them land. The only reason he promised them land where they could have freedom and be land owners is because they had come from a place where they did not have that. They had the opposite of that. God will promise you something, but he will do it in the midst of your problem. And it will be a struggle to get the promise. Come on now. Because can, can let me just say this? Because the way that the enemy works is he always posts, he posts himself at the gate of your promise. So if you think you're gonna snatch up your promise without the enemy having to go through the enemy, you're crazy. He will post, and so the harder it gets, and the more you have to struggle, the closer you are to getting your promise. Come on now. If it's easy and you're just walking towards your promise, you ain't there yet. But when all hell breaks loose and everything begins to struggle and you begin to question God and wonder if he's there and wonder if he's forgotten you, baby, you are almost there. Don't you quit. Don't you give up because you have run into the enemy's territory, which is at the gate of your breakthrough. And the reason we even can say the word breakthrough is that there's been opposition. Why does the church preach about breakthrough all the time, but, but they don't talk about the opposition? You can't have breakthrough without opposition. We get breakthrough because there's a problem. We get breakthrough because there's a struggle. We get breakthrough because he's posted himself so you can't get your promise. Listen, the harder it is for me to go to small group, the more valuable it is for me to go. Come on now. I'm introverted as a cat running backwards from a Doberman pincher. I don't, listen, even being up here every week, I almost throw up before I come up here. Every single week. And God has called me, listen, he did not call me to ease, to ease in Zion. He called me to something that every week would be a struggle for me. It's a struggle for me to talk to you out there in the foyer. He called me to the struggle because it is in the struggle that I can trust him. I have to trust him. It is in the struggle that he develops in me the characteristics that he needs for me to do what he's called me to do. It is, the, I mean, the more I struggle, the more I trust him. Amen? All right. Some of you aren't trusting him. You know his recipe for that, remedy for that? Put a little struggle in your life. Because you'll trust him real quick. Some of you have quit praying. Some of you stopped praying and you've forgotten God because life has got a little bit easy. I want to propose to you today, God might allow a little bit of trouble to hit your life so you'll start praying again. I I know this is crazy. It's like, oh my gosh, what kind of church am I coming to? I hear all the time, "I I can't grow in this church. I can't grow in that church. I can't grow in this environment. I can't grow in the environment of frustration. I'm frustrated here. Pastor doesn't feed me. Listen, I've worked with several pastors as an associate, and most of them were great men. Notice how I said most of them. Because not all pastors are great men, and not all you are great men and women. That's just the percentage, people. Sorry. Some of you are like, that's why I sit on this side of the room. Anyway, uh, moving on. 
I've worked with several pastors, and many of them were great men, but they were terrible teachers. It, it is why I value studying. That's why I value it so much. That's why I value I, I spend 10 to 15 hours a week studying for these sermons so that I preach something to your life that will be helpful for you and not just preach some message that won't help you grow. I value it. It's important to me. It is what they were not that made me want to study. Conversely, I find that when you give people a lot of word easily, you make them lazy. I want you to understand that when God gets ready to use you in a mighty way, your circumstances are often opposite of your destiny. Do not begrudge the things that are happening around you that are not like what God is calling you to because sometimes he will place you in darkness and call you to be a light. And it is in that place where there is lack that we then have an opportunity to become and meet the need of that lack. Instead of running and going somewhere else that has it, God's called you to be it in the place of lack. That's good stuff. Did I make sense? Did I make sense? Some of us are trying to run, run, trying to find the thing our hope longs for. But that hope, your heart has hope and longs for that because he's called you to be that in environments where it doesn't exist. We need to stop running to try to find the thing that satisfies our soul. And we need to become the thing that helps satisfy other people's soul in the midst of lack. That's good stuff. That's good stuff right there. That's how we become the church. He gives you power because you are surrounded by weakness. What? Okay. He gives you hunger for greatness because you come from an environment of mediocrity. If you want to see something great come up, watch something come up from nothing. The hardest thing in the world is to get greatness from people who are surrounded by greatness. See, rich people give their kids everything except what made them rich. Oh, this is good. See, for a lot of wealthy people, it was the struggle that made them tenacious enough to fight the fight and stay up on their feet and do whatever it takes and continue to sacrifice until they got a breakthrough. It was the struggle that made them rich. Hardworking people often work hard to give their children everything they didn't have, and what you are giving them is actually crippling them from being like you. And they have riches, but they are not rich in character. Oh, that's good stuff. You know that whole, I'd rather teach a man to fish than give a man to fish? So we have wealthy people that are giving their children fish and not teaching them how to fish. And we're sending them out to, be, to be, live lives of poverty because we want to give them what we didn't have. But what we really need to give them is the character that we had that made us what we are. Oh, that's good. That's good. Mm. Oh, damn. Oh, come on. And this is the same way in the church. <laughs> it's when we build churches, God, like, listen to me. Please hear my heart. Please hear my heart. We, are, we have built churches today in this generation that is giving people everything that we didn't have. Cool screens, cool lights, cool. I had a pew and there was no cushion on it. And there were times, I remember a couple times as a kid, I was sliding around. I got a splinter in my butt just sitting in church. And we make it so easy and so exciting and, and so fun. And there's great visuals. And we don't, we don't have to struggle to really get knowledge. Listen, here is the extent. Like even kids today got a great, they got iPads up in here, right? <laughs> Thank God. I mean, I, you know, that's, I think that's great or whatever. Ish. My experience when growing up is pews, it hurt, and my mom was pinching me all the time, and the harder she pinched, the more I knew I was getting it later. That was my church experience. It was a struggle, and to get a word in that kind of environment was hard. That's all right. I still got saved at the age of five, pinching and all, splinters and all, and it was a struggle. And see, that struggle helped me chase something in a way that many young people today won't chase them. Come on now. Sometimes we need to stop making it so easy for our kids and so easy for the church people. Sometimes we got to strip it back. Sometimes, and we've done it here, 
Sometimes we've forgotten them because we've gotten so busy producing something that we've taken the production totally away. Have you noticed? Because we're giving it to you on a platter instead of allowing you to find it yourself. Some of us have produced to the expense of forgetting God. All right. Samuel is surrounded. Listen. By, this is where I'm going. Samuel was surrounded by everything he was not. <laughs> the leadership is old and out of touch. Doesn't hear the word of the Lord anymore. The word of the Lord was scarce in that day. He had never even met God, knew God, or heard God. There was no open vision. His spiritual father was waning in his spiritual authority disconnected and disfranchised in his ability. His peers, Eli's son, was filled with lust and debauchery. The priest's son was filled with lust and debauchery. There were con artists and scams in the house of God. Israel had lost its relevance, its integrity, and its power. It was surrounded by priests without prophets. We have worship without word. We have emotion without direction. And much like people today, it's not hard to get people to worship God. It's hard to get them to work for him. It's not hard to get people to come to church. It's hard to get them to go out and be the church. Much like today, there was a form of godliness denying the power thereof. And it is in the conflict of this circumstance that God then speaks to Samuel and calls him to greatness. What is your circumstance? Whatever it is, God is speaking in the midst of your circumstance and he's calling you to greatness. And you can choose to be like the world and do things like the world or you can choose that in the midst of what your environment is saying to be different than your environment so that you can be great for the kingdom of God. It's a struggle, people. Hannah struggled to bring Samuel where he was. She actually struggles to give birth to him and get him into position. It was a struggle. But someone had to fight to bring you into a place that you're having to fight right now for. You are standing. There are some of you here today that are standing on the backs of someone else's struggle to be where you are right now. And you have a responsibility. Since those who went before you struggled... To bring you where you are does not mean you are entitled to not live a life of struggle yourself. It's still going to cost you something. And for us to go from 30-fold to 60-fold to 100-fold is to not just stand on the back of our parents' struggle and devalue it and be apathetic and say, well, they struggled so I can be here. But it is struggle to reach the new dimension of God. And although they struggled does not give you the right to not struggle yourself, God has called you to reach towards more. You might have grown up in a great environment. You might have grown up in a great home. You might have grown up with great parents. You might have grown up with, 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 with great advantages. But I came here today to tell you there's more for you. God still wants you to struggle for more. Don't become complacent and common with that, which people have broke their backs to get you to. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. I have to confess to you today. I'm, I'm going to say this just a few more things. I just got to do it. I have to confess, I'm weary. I'm weary today of counseling people. I'll be honest with you, I don't even like it too much. I love people. I'm a pastor. But I don't like counseling them a whole lot. You have to put some roadblocks up, set some alligators out, put some piranhas with some pools to to, to try to divert me to go and to counsel people. You have to chase me down to get me to want to counsel people today. I only do it if I have to. Because people today, they need counseling in areas that make me tired. Listen, they think normal is a spiritual attack straight from the pits of hell. They think they are up under spiritual warfare because they have to go to work. How do you counsel that? That's normal. They think they're up under demonic attack because their emotions aren't feeling so good. You're like, Sean, that's the point of emotions. I know. I know. I'm tired of putting a lot of energy in trying to help people fight normal. They don't seem to understand that to him who much is given, much is required. 
We pray that God would bless us with much, but we do not want... We do great with the blessing part. We do bad with the required part. God, give me much. Don't require anything. God, give me much. I don't want to be... Don't require anything from me. They want to take what's given and refuse to to reciprocate what is required. There is something you learn in a fight that helps you understand and stand on the blessing. Samuel's struggle to be great and to hear God when no one else was hearing God was different than Hannah's struggle, but it was a struggle nonetheless. To break the gravitational pull of his environment was a struggle for Samuel. His environment was carnal and mediocre, yet God had put greatness in him, but his greatness had to break the gravitational pull of his environment. Gravity, the thing that keeps pulling you back down. He was in an environment where not only he didn't know the Lord, but the people around him were indifferent to the Lord. And for them it was okay. See, see, wrong looks right when everybody else is doing it. I found in the church today that many of us are not like Samuel because we see everybody else being apathetic and everybody else doing wrong and everybody else not hearing from God. So then it gives us permission. And quite honestly, if you see an orchard of trees and none of them have good fruit, then not many people are going to pay attention to the fact that you have bad fruit. Let me put it to you another way. The other day, my wife, yesterday, my wife, we were driving. I normally drive really slow like a grandpa. This time I was putting the pedal to the metal, baby. She actually she had some kind of like music going. And I was just like, your foot just like, you know, and I was just going. Going real fast. And she looked at me and she said, Sean, you're going 85 miles an hour. And I said, I'm just following the flow of the, and I stopped. Some of us think because everyone else is going fast that it's okay for us to go fast. But see, greatness is going against the gravitational pull of the traffic. That's the struggle. Come on now. Sometimes the struggle is just doing what's right in the midst of all those who are doing what's wrong. That's the struggle. Can you be different than the atmosphere you've been growing up in? I'm going to put this picture up here, and I really have more I want to share, but I can't because I'm out of time. All right, anyway, um, this is a chick. And chicks can take between 24, around 24, I'll just say that, 24 hours to break, when they begin breaking the shell, to break out of the shell. If you, as a, what are they, what are they called, the people that raise up chickens? Chicken raiser. What are they called? Farmer? I don't know. Chicken raiser, whatever. Farmer. If you, as a chicken raiser farmer, <laughs> have all these chicks and they begin to hatch and you were to reach in and begin to break that shell away you'll kill the chick and the more she, you know and some of us are like oh, oh that poor thank you. oh she's look at that chick it's such a precious little chick I'm going to help it get out of there look at it it's just struggling so hard I just hate to see that chick struggle you killed it Can I say this? We have parents that are killing their children's destiny because we won't let them struggle. I'm talking to myself right now. Oh, man, we're killing our children's destiny. We have have pastors that are killing killing members of their church. They're killing their destiny because we don't want them to struggle. Because as a pastor, we look at you struggling and we go, oh, I just want to help them. I want to help them. But it is in the helping them that we kill their destiny. It is in the struggle that they're able to survive and live in the fullness of what God has called them to. Be careful. Friends, friends, when your friend comes to you and and they're like, I just feel so horrible. I just feel so horrible. I feel like a failure. I just feel like I did this. Don't try to appease them and make them feel like everything they've done is okay. Sometimes that conviction is good. It's that struggle with that conviction that really solidifies their heart. Don't talk people out of what the Holy Spirit is trying to talk them into. 
Because if you see their struggle and you try to save them from their struggle, they will die and not fulfill their destiny. Oh, come on now. It's important that we understand. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you these points and you can go study them out by reading them yourself. Listen, first thing is, first thing is, I don't have time to do them all. We will struggle. The second thing is, Samuel served in his struggle. Let me say it this way. Samuel served while he was struggling. Some of you go, I can't serve the Lord because I'm still struggling. Mm. Samuel served while he was struggling. And it was because he served while he was struggling that God spoke to him. Some of you want a word from God, but maybe prayer is not how you get it. Maybe you serving in your struggle is. All right, that's good. That's good. The last thing is submitted. He submitted to what the Lord called him to do. We will struggle. We must serve. And when he calls us up to greatness, we must say yes, Lord, to his will and to his way.